Today's video is all about Bitcoin. We're going to be going over a bunch of charts and metrics that are timely and relevant and up to date. Just talking about why Bitcoin is getting ready to explode in the next year plus. This is a must watch. It puts a lot of stuff together. I'm going to start off here real quick with something a few of you have probably seen in a few of my videos. Um, we have the quad happening this time around with the Bitcoin halving cycle. I keep upping it. Um, but we have Bitcoin ETFs where we have boomers with the largest amount of inflows ever. That doesn't just include here. It looks like South Korea is spinning them up and Hong Kong is going to too. And there's a reason behind that. It's to control capital outflows, but it will still be a pull to drive the price of Bitcoin higher. We'll talk about that later. FASB accounting rules have, have been voluntarily implemented by a bunch of companies that are holding Bitcoin. That is a huge plus. Tells corporations they have the okay to start adding this stuff to their balance sheet. Huge. We have the Bitcoin halving. That's actually coming up in 58 days. Huge. That's when the rate gets cut in half. We'll go over that in one of the, video, one of the images here too, where we're going from roughly 900 a day of Bitcoin production down to 450. Uh, we'll also show how strong demand it still is and how if you compare demand to the supply getting cut in half, along with all the other things that are happening, this is just going to get crazy. Um, rate cuts. Rate cuts are stimulative. They make it to where people can start taking loans again. They make it to, they'll make it to where the housing market can start to open up and start to see volumes. They'll make it to where people aren't afraid to buy a car because they don't want to pay 8% plus. It, it's stimulative and it helps open up the economy and that will be beneficial as well. And I make an argument in here where even if we're in a recession, Bitcoin can, can still yield great rewards, if not even greater. And I'm going to make a representation from what happened with the Bitcoin or the gold ETF uh, many years ago, around the time of the great financial crisis. There's a lot of stuff we're connecting in this one, guys. Without further ado, let's get to it. All right. My friend Luke posted this one. This is great. It says, where is Bitcoin on its developmental cycle? And if you look at it compared to other technologies, and this doesn't name them all, it just shows images like auto and you know, phones and planes and computers and games and phone, like everything that we have, right? All the different technologies that have emerged, you can see where Bitcoin is in its cycle and it is so low and so early. So you're, you're still early, guys. You're still early and you'll understand that from a lot of these charts in a second. The halving, like I said, only 58 days away. We only have less than two months and supply gets cut in half, or at least the new supply gets cut in half. Very, very big deal. Supply demand dynamics are something that you need to understand if you're an investor to its core. Net Bitcoin inflows. Look at this. You can see where it was a rocky start since the beginning of October, right? You can see where it was up and then it was down and it was up and then it was down. And then come January, we started to really see it get its groove, and now it's just up. Demand for Bitcoin is huge. The GBTC outflows, the grayscale outflows, are down significantly. Now there are, there's always fud about like, oh hey, these guys that you know had bad accounts are going to be able to start liquidating. We're getting to the point to where liquidations don't even matter. If 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 some big entity, you know, starts releasing coins for whatever. It just doesn't matter anymore. And here's the thing. Even if they did, there's something you have to understand. This comes up every cycle. Everybody's like, oh my God, blah, blah, blah is going to, Mt. Gox is going to release stuff and it's all the outflows. These people that have been invested, they know where they are in the market cycle. They know that we're at the beginning of it and they're not going to sell yet. It doesn't create downward pressure. Think of it like it was you. Would you be like, oh, hey, I finally got my Bitcoin back from Mt. Gox. I should sell before the halving. No, you don't do that. Nobody does that. So use common sense. Only people that are desperate, a small percentage, would actually look to do that if they needed capital. That's it. Otherwise, people that are trying to grow wealth, they're going to hold hodl. They're going to hold it. Next chart. BlackRock. Look at this. Again, I don't love BlackRock. 
at all. I don't, I think they're just greedy. I think they try and push a bunch of agendas that I don't agree with all of them. Maybe some of it's okay. A lot of it ain't. And I think that I don't like corporations trying to dictate the future of humanity. I think that we can, we can focus ourselves on making the world a better place and what vision we have. Anyway, I digress. I do have a little bit in, in, in IBIT because um, one of my simple IRAs from some previous employer threw it in there, um, whatever. Mostly, I like Fidelity, FBTC. These guys are true Bitcoin patriots. They've been around pre-2017 for a long, long time trying to support this network. And so I believe personally that if you're going to support anybody, it should be them because they actually care about, about Bitcoin. These guys, this is just more money to them. But I digress. Let's get to let's focus here. This is still very positive for the network because this now we have the largest entity for investing. They like over 12 trillion, 13. I don't even know what these guys have anymore. So it's, it's a ton of AUM assets under management, right? And they're now pushing it with their thousands and thousands of financial advisors. They're pushing this ETF. And you can see it from the inflows. They're number one for a reason. Even though Fidelity's number two, my FBTC. Love that. I love that the Patriots are in there too. But this is only going to continue. This is steepening. And again, when combined with what we're seeing in net, net inflows, this is beautiful. There's some other charts here too. You can see the growth of BlackRock versus Fidelity. This, these are my boys right here. But look at this. Look at how quickly it is growing. I'm going to pause right near the end here. Oh, I missed it. Let me just manually move it. Can I do that? Ah, beautiful. Love that. So again, right near the end here, this is as of the 15th. It's like a, I, it didn't get Friday's close. I think that was the 16th or 17th, whatever. But you can see how large these entities have become in a short period of time. They're just exploding higher. Just exploding. This is just another visual way of representing that. Let's move on. All right, not just that, OTC desk. What is an OTC desk? It's over-the-counter trading. Basically, it's kind of, think of spot markets. And spot markets are just like, I've got Bitcoin. It went up a ton. I sold it manually. When you start going to spot markets for Bitcoin, when the big guys do, and they're having to start to get to there. I haven't talked about this in a while, but I've said it in other videos. Their Coinbase had a large quantity of reserves for Bitcoin holdings, right? before the ETF was launched. It makes sense that they would do that. That's probably one of the drivers of Bitcoin before the ETF launch was Coinbase just trying to accumulate as much as they could before the having, or I should say, before the launch of the Bitcoin ETFs because they, they knew that, hey, we can't just have these ETFs get launched and then price out everybody who wants to buy them. They couldn't have that. So what do they do? They stack a bunch and then People buy into the ETFs as the price drops. Then you have people that have vested interest later on. And when the price starts to turn around a few months later, like you can see here, here, let me just do this. We'll go to the four hour. You can see how Bitcoin's price, this is the ETF launch, this gold bar. You can see how it shot up and then just plummeted 21%. So that was, I think, Coinbase taking from their inventory of Bitcoin so that the price didn't draw up. And so they did this over a period of, let's see, January 11th to the 23rd. So they gave about a 12-day window where people could get it at a cheaper price. And then again, another week or two where it wasn't crazy. And now it's going up. And so now you have $10 billion worth of AUM that is in the money. And you want that. And it's a very smart move to have that. But also, OTC desks, they're running dry. And OTC desks are like what Coinbase has, right? They got they, they do over-the-counter trading along with a few others. Like GBTC was an over-the-counter trade before it became an ETF. And, and they're running dry. You could look here at the total desks. This shows the price of Bitcoin, and it shows how much they have. And since June of 2023, the number is just gone. It's gone. So now it's spot prices, and that's when things get crazy. Don't believe me? Look at the price of uranium in the last year. But that's not all of it. Banks now are telling the SEC that they want to be able to hold these Bitcoin ETFs. They're saying, hey, 
you got to fix your accounting rules here. We want in. We want a part, part of the pie. They don't want to lose out on this. They can see the money, and they're becoming more desperate. They're pushing the SEC for this, and they will get it. And banks, you'll see Wells Fargo or whatever else, where they'll have your ETFs in there in the investment portfolios, and they'll be pushing them too. Crazy times. Then I'm showing you this one real quick here. I'm showing you this one for a reason. I'm just going to zoom in here. So before we start talking about Hong Kong, South Korea met with Gary Gensler to talk about Bitcoin ETFs. And they and they want to create their own. They did this like, I think it was last week or maybe the week before. And then on top of that, we have a bunch of Bitcoin ETFs for Hong Kong that they're trying to spin up. Well, why am I showing you an article that says that Hong Kong authorities arrest seven in a $14 billion money laundering case? China is incredibly scared of having capital outflows. They've had a ton already. They can't have it. So they're desperate to keep the money there. So what are they doing? They're trying to offer their investors Bitcoin ETFs. Why? Because if they do that, they can control that capital flight. How? Because then they have people taking their retirement accounts or investment accounts in China and investing in these Bitcoin ETFs, thinking that they're like holding Bitcoin and making it to where they don't exit out of their investment accounts and instead put them in these entities. And why? Because they can control these. They can, they can monitor the activity of these ETFs. They can make sure that that money isn't fleeing. So these Bitcoin ETFs are just a way for China to try and make it to where the vast majority of funds are staying in their country if they're providing liquidity to their, to their markets. So I think that th this will get rubber stamped. I've been thinking about this for a while. This article set it off for me. I think that we'll see Bitcoin ETFs in Hong Kong too. So not only do we have trillions in AUM from boomers that is available for Bitcoin related ETFs and for corporations to get involved now that the accounting rules are better, but then we have South Korea and then we have the second largest economy in the world, China getting on board so that they can protect themselves from more capital outflows. So great stuff. And then at the same time, I told you that the halving is coming in 58 days. But wait, am I too soon? Am I too soon? Well, I showed you that chart that showed that we're really early in, in the developmental cycle of Bitcoin and its ramp to adoption, right? But here is another one from my boy, Will Clemente. He's brilliant. It shows Google trend data about Bitcoin. Nobody cares. Nobody cares about Bitcoin right now. We're not near the top of this cycle. It is just getting started. This is my third cycle. I have done research going back to the beginning of time. I can tell you, this is just getting started. Oh, and real quick, down below, down here. I, oh, I'm not trying to, somebody said I was trying to show my muscles. I'm not. Down here, I just don't, it's weird pointing in different directions than what you think you are. I have a disclaimer at the bottom of this page. It says that I am not a financial advisor and I'm not giving individual financial advice. I'm literally telling an entertainment story about my perspective, what I think is going on in this investment world with Bitcoin, and potentially my plans for how I'm going to act with it. So if you want a financial advisor, speak to one. I'm just a high school dropout and a wannabe. Okay, there's my disclaimer. You got it in writing. You got it in audio. You got it in video. We're good now. We can move on. All right. This is another thing I wanted to point out. I just did a series of posts on these. We're going to roll through them real quick. I don't want to beat a dead horse. This right here, though, is what I wanted to show you. Balances on exchange for Bitcoin have been plummeting since right before the pandemic. Isn't it interesting that around that time, things got you know, a little rough, started to slow down. But what did people do? They started getting Bitcoin and taking it off exchanges. And that process, it, it petered out a little bit near the peaks in Bitcoin's price in the last cycle, which got neutered. I'll keep saying this got neutered by the Fed raising rates at the most aggressive rate in history. But you could see how people started putting some Bitcoin back on exchanges because they had to sell it, right? Like that's how you sell it. But now it's just going down again. It's just going down. And so you have, and you saw a real steep drop here um, back around here too in like January of 2023. This was right around the time where we started to see some banking collapse, crashes and stuff. People just started, again, it's just all, all of it was gone. You could see that people were getting worried. They took it off exchanges and now we're really low. We're really low. And that's great. Why? Because we know the OTC deaths are running dry. 
And if the OTC deaths are running dry, and we could see all these ETFs coming that want more of it, but then there's not as much on exchanges. Ah, uh, rocket fuel. This is rocket fuel. You need to understand this is rocket fuel for the price. More so than I've ever seen in the history of this. All right, this is a little outdated, but here's what I wanted to, a point I wanted to make here. Bitcoin, it says 400 billion. It's like a tr trillion, trillion now, right? It's bigger. So double the size of this little blob. But look at the rest of these. Here's what people don't understand. Housing is unaffordable. Uh, real estate's unaffordable. Yeah, you're right, it is. Why is it unaffordable? Because people use it as a store of value. Bonds are a store of value. Money, when you're holding cash, that's a store of value. Shitty one, but it is one. Equities, when you buy stocks, is that not a store of value? Why do you buy stocks? So you can make money in the future by them appreciating a value from the money printing going on, right? Because the company's grown, the money printing continues, and you're expecting higher returns in the future, right? That's how you make money off of equities. Why do people collect cars and collectibles? Why do they collect art? These are store of values. Gold is a store of value. What do you think Bitcoin is? It's the best store of value. It's way more liquid than real estate. It's better than bonds because the governments are printing so much money, they're destroying their, their, their entire country. And don't get me wrong, I think this can maintain for a while, but it's devastating to people that don't own assets, right? And it makes you question whether the bonds from these governments are any good. Now, sure, we're the world reserve currency. We're the last one that'll drop, right? We're the last hammer to go. But other countries have already felt this pain. Their bonds are worthless. Their bonds default, right? Their dollars become worthless. Argentina, inflation, 200% plus. Um, all these countries that had massive inflation because they printed too much money. Bitcoin solves all of this. It makes housing more affordable because people stop putting money into a liquid assets that price everybody else out of real estate and instead put it in one of the most liquid assets you can find on this planet where you can, there's been cases where people have moved a billion and a half dollars across the world at a time when Bitcoin didn't have high transaction volume and they spent five bucks, five bucks. And, it, and there was barely any like float in the price and any loss from, from selling a billion and a half worth of Bitcoin or transferring. Like it's getting so much better and the larger the network gets, the more liquid it becomes, the more easily it can handle large volumes of money. You can't do that with art. You can't do that with gold. Try and get, try and leave a country where you where you saved up a bunch of gold because you were afraid the world was going to fall apart. Try taking that gold on a plane. See how far you get. You can't move this stuff. What are you going to do? You're going to chip it off with the chisel when you want to go pay somebody during the apocalypse? Like, don't get me wrong. I'm not going to go into a diatribe here. Yeah, if the, there's no electricity in the world or computers left, Bitcoin can have problems too. Albeit, you can send it by satellite. And you could even send it by like text message. You could even just write it down on a piece of paper and send it somewhere. As long as the mining network was still holding up somewhere in the world. But I digress. We can take from this entire pot. The entire thing. Imagine what happens if we just nibble on a percent of $330 trillion in the real estate market. 1% of the $300 trillion bond market. 1% of the $100 trillion, $20 trillion money market or the $115 trillion equities market or the $18 trillion art, 12 gold, 6 collectibles. Bitcoin just needs a percent and the number's like a million dollars. You got to understand this. Did you know that Bitcoin is already at new all-time highs compared to the Japanese yen? Yes, it is. How is that possible? Because the Japanese yen has lost 31% of its value compared to the US dollar since 2021, the last Bitcoin peak cycle, right? Right around that range. So they're already there. People, Some people are like, oh, Bitcoin's not going to break its all-time. Bullshit. It already has. Let's just compare Bitcoin to everything else over the last four years. This is between August 10th of 2020 and February 16th of 2024. Which one did you want to own? 
I'm not good with math. Tell me. Which one? The big green one? Let's talk about gold. Let's talk about what Bitcoin could do in a recession. Let's talk about the inflation rate of gold. It's rough. It's rough to know the inflation rate of gold. Why is that? Because we have paper gold. Paper gold that isn't highly accountable. And what do I mean by that? Bitcoin has a ledger. You can quantify and clarify how much you hold, right? How much an entity holds, what the wallets are. It's pseudo-anonymous. So you can figure this stuff out. There's things like chain analytics that help you figure this stuff out, right? Now, gold doesn't have that. And so there's been a bunch of paper inflation of gold where they probably don't all hold gold, but they've been able to suppress the price that way. Can't do that with Bitcoin. What about the inflation rate of gold, the new inflation rate? This is last cycle, okay? Bitcoin was at 1.8% this last cycle. That's right now. We're getting ready to move to a new one. Gold's inflation rate is roughly 2.5, but I would argue it's higher than that because of the paper inflation and the fact that a lot of these, could you, you could never cash it out, right? It's like, it's like fiat. It's garbage. It's not backed by anything. It's like banks. Oh, the banks are safe. Really? What are their capital requirements? Oh, some of these are like 10% or less. That's how much of your money they actually have because of the debt that they issue. So these are all a house of cards. Bitcoin is not. And they can't cheat the system. Because if at any point we say, we need to know how much of your Bitcoin you're holding, we can figure that stuff out. People have already done it. We, we did it just a year and a half ago during all these like little bank collapses and Silvergate and all. People discovered so quickly who was liquid and who wasn't. It's beautiful. Back to my point here. Bitcoin's inflation rate is currently around 1.8%, 1.9%. Gold is 25 or more. Maybe double that, right? You'll never find a good number. Never. But in 58 days, it'll be 0.9% for Bitcoin. So you have an inflation rate that's a fraction of gold, but much more liquid and transportable. Oh. And people that say that Bitcoin isn't a store of value or a hedge, talk to Larry Fink, the head of BlackRock, who says that Bitcoin is gold 2.0. Why do you think he thinks that? Because it's better. All right. It's my boy, Fred Krueger. He's a good dude. He's saying that at the current rate of growth, and I actually think we're accelerating, so I think it'll be well before the end of 2024, Bitcoin ETFs will exceed gold. Wrap your head around that. This is a chart I love. I just created this, actually, because somebody was talking to me like, how will Bitcoin do in a recession? We're going to talk about that real quick. My thoughts in regard to that. So... I'm referencing 2008, right? You can see it down here, 2008, June 2008. This actually, the, the Bitcoin ETF, or I should say the gold ETF, was introduced remarkably right before the great financial crisis. Isn't that interesting? I'm not a big conspiracy theory guy. I think a lot of that stuff is complete BS. But don't you find it fascinating that in 2007, like I think it was March 2007, the government approved gold ETFs as a lifeboat for the rich and powerful to be able to make sure that they rode out the great financial crisis and didn't have to worry about a downward spiral. Why would they do that? Here's why, here's why I would do it, right? I can't speak to the government, but here's why I would do it. Because I would want to know that there are people that are positioned with massive amounts of wealth that once they believe the stock market is too low, they're able to put that in to the stock market. And gold is a great way to do that. It was an inverse way to do that. The dollar was okay, but it wouldn't make you money. It wasn't a great hedge, right? The dollar would just be worth the dollar, but a little bit less because they had to print a bunch of it. They had to print $875 billion to save our financial system at that time. Seems like nothing today. It's like a Tuesday, right? But it was really important back then. Now, here's my point. We just did a we just did a Bitcoin ETF. Isn't that interesting? Isn't it isn't the timing interesting? So if you're worried about a recession, isn't it interesting that we have a Bitcoin ETF that was newly approved right around the time before 
what the Bears think is going to be another great reception. Think about that. Let's look at something else. Here's a point I wanted to make. Right here, we peaked in about... On the S&P about June, uh, July maybe, of 2007, right? That was kind of the peak. And I'm showing you in the green arrow what gold did going all the way out to 2012, 2013. After that, right? But look at the S&P and all the indices are like this. They're down. Rough. But what happened here? Gold shot up. Bitcoin shooting up right now. Isn't that amazing? Shooting up at like a record pace. Gold did that too, right? It actually had a huge increase. 60% in a little over a year, I mean, in Bitcoin terms, that's a much, Bitcoin would be a much greater number because of economies of scale and the way it moves. But Bitcoin's doing that. Isn't that fascinating? Now, gold did retrace, right? It retraced. But you were still at a better level than when the when the gold ETF came out, right? You were still higher at the low. And gold bottomed not one year earlier. I need to update this graphic. It's more like nine months earlier than the S&P. So gold, by the time the S&P bottomed, gold was still up 60% in a year and a half. Think of Bitcoin as hundreds and hundreds of percent by that time, right? 500, 1,000. Let's just throw out some easy math. Probably 1,000. <laughs> but, so look at this. So, so it was the inverse. And then when the S&P bottomed, what did people do? They sold some gold and they started buying, right? But the S&P struggled for a while. Even with all the, all the liquidity coming in, there were so many jobs lost. Unemployment got so high. There were so many people that were wrecked by owning a bunch of real estate and having adjustable rate mortgages. There was so much collateral damage that the markets, even all the way out, years after the start of the great financial crisis, over four years, five years later, they still didn't reach all-time highs. The S&P was down 17%. This is everybody's big fear. Well, what did, what did gold do? Gold, four or five years later, was worth 190%. This is the peak, by the way, and then it started to go down. And then the market started to really go up. So here's my point. Maybe, just maybe, all the benefits of Bitcoin, and because it's more liquid, it's more transportable, it's immutable, it's still pseudo-anonymous, now it's rubber-stamped by our governments around the world as an asset that people can hold in retirement accounts and that banks want to hold. If Bitcoin is gold 2.0, what asset do you want to be holding during, during the next Great Recession? Because they're going to have to print the hell out of the dollar to, to, to make it to where we survive if something like that happens. I'm not even sure it's coming yet. But I'm just saying, if it did, which would you want to hold? Seem to have screwed up my camera. Just give me a second. Getting too excited, man. There we go. That's better. Which would you want to hold? Just easy math to me, guys. I think I covered most of this here. We printed 35% of the money that's ever existed in our country's history, 35 to 40% just since the pandemic. All that money sitting on the sidelines. We got the new FASB accounting rules that are going to allow corporations to weather the storm with Bitcoin too. And Bitcoin. Again, Bitcoin had that dip, but now it's up. And this looks beautiful, guys. It looks like we're ready to launch again. I said, hey, we could go down to 46, 40, 48 and test before we go for the 56, 57 because of all the volume, because there's so much volume. This blue line is the halving. This gold line or gold line is Bitcoin's ETF. And I represented it for gold because, again, it's gold 2.0. Bitcoin is the color of gold, right? It is the new gold. But what I wanted to show you here is that we have this cliff up around the 56, 57 range. But I, I don't know. Again, I've said this a few times. I actually think that Bitcoin might run to 66 before the halving in less than 58 days. You got it. I'm on this lifeboat. 
If it goes down, I'm going to get more on this lifeboat. I've got over a million, I think, right now, at least. And that's not even including my private stash that I don't touch or disclose. That's just my investment account. And I think that Bitcoin can go from here at 150K. Didn't mean to do that. All the way up to here at 270. That's my targets for this cycle in the next year and a half. If I'm right, that is so much money. I got to move these because it keeps going up. I'm always having to move this stuff. I'm just going to get rid of this one. So that's 432%. But then you have Bitcoin miners that, if I'm right, can do 2 to 3x that. Maybe 4 if conditions are good. Unbelievable. Can you imagine a 13x on a miner? I wouldn't hold it that long. Miners will probably be out by 150k. Not going to lie. That's what I do. I dial out of risk. I dial out of multipliers on the way up, right? This is, this is my long-term chart. I added this to my portfolio, at the, my pen tweet at the top. Take a look at this if you want to. It shows kind of my target for the high. It shows all the previous ones. You can see how we had these steeper declines in what I call the mid-cycle for the Bitcoin halving or the, or the Bitcoin cycle where we like grinded up against this before we launched. We're at that right now, guys. I can show you this in a second, but we're at it basically. We're ready to launch. And so you can see how the, the, they become a little less steep every cycle, right? It's like magic. Now, it's important to know though, how are we going to know when we're done? Again, we can use things like the BLX indicator where I've drawn out previous cycles. I've analyzed them from days before the halving to after, from lows to highs, from highs to lows, Fibonacci's, um, peaks in RSI, all these different things, right? But we can also, there's a ton of tools to know when we peaked. This is one right here. It's the thermal cap ratio. And I actually, so I draw this a little bit lower and I, here's what I, here's what I think. I think that we would have hit the thermal cap up here on this downward trend if the Fed hadn't neutered Bitcoin cycle along with SPACs and memes and all the other shit, right? All the garbage. I say other shit. That, that, that was shit. Bitcoin is not shit. Just to be clear, Bitcoin is not shit. But there's this tool where I think we can use this and there's a ton of other metrics. There's so many metrics that you can use that are seen on sites like Glassnode that I follow. I subscribe to a bunch of stuff so that you guys don't have to. I just want to be clear on that. And MR, MRV Z score is another, or I'm sorry, MVRV Z score is another good one. You can see how this is done. And again, there's a slightly downward slope, but you can see how this has been valuable. We haven't even started yet, guys. And again, it hit the red line. Maybe it's just a hair underneath the red line this time because of that downward slope. But again, I think that this one would have actually been like up here in the red. So I think the low end of the red is another good indicator. I will be following that. There is just so many different indicators that can show us when we're topping. There's the, there's the Bitcoin rainbow chart. I don't know if I have that one in here. Let me just type it. It's probably in here. Nope, it's not. All right, well, you know what? We can do a Google search, right? Bitcoin rainbow chart. There's so many different really good charts. There's plan B stuff, which he's still good. I like him too. I like him a lot. I just, again, I think that, I think he got shit luck last time because of what the Fed did. It, it neutered the cycle. But you can see here where when we get into the orange and red bands, actually even just red, not the top tier this time, it was saying, hey, we could be near, near top. The deep red is the top going all the way back here. If you look, that's the top one. And I think we would have reached it this time too, right about here, like I said, except fastest rate of increase in history. This is where we are now. Look at where we are. This is the buy zone still. Again, guys, and look at this. You can see after the halving, kind of when the peaks are, and it would have been right about here, it's about the same time. It might be quicker, I think, this time, because I think we'll have... Such wicked velocity because of all the, the potential inflows. But this is what I wanted to show you guys. I know we just went through a lot. Oh, there actually is something else I want to show too. Let me see if I can find it here. I want to go back. I showed you the exchange balances. Let's go back one though because there's other stuff I want to look at. 
How do we know that Bitcoin, the demand side is still strong? It's consistent. This is, this is the, this is the number of new addresses. And I can show this by like wallet count of like 0.1 BTC or higher, or whatever. It's pretty much the same, right? It might be slanted a little bit lower, but it's pretty much the same when you get into bigger numbers of Bitcoin in these addresses. But the number of addresses keeps growing at a consistent rate. That lets us know demand is still there. What else we got? Well, like I said, we got that. This is another view of, of the issuance rate, right? And this shows that amount right here. We're way underneath gold at this. We're like 30% of what gold is. And we're getting ready to drop even more. But then at the same time, well, what about Bitcoin? I heard it's not good for transactions. Really? Because the transaction growth is still pretty awesome. People are still using it. And then there's transactions through the Lightning Network, which like a lot of countries in Africa, like I just posted something about Kenya today, and parts of Central America, like El Salvador, are starting to incorporate where they can spend Bitcoin, but pay virtually nothing in fees, like a penny. Way better than a credit card company. So my whole point is you've got massive demand, right? You got all this demand from the Bitcoin ETFs all around the world. You have the FASB accounting rules in the States making it easier for corporations to start putting this on their balance sheet. You got the halving coming up in 15 or 58 days. You got the rate cuts. You got the fact that we're seeing incredibly do reduced re supply from OTC desks, that the exchange balances are lower than they've been in ages. And then you have, it, with all this demand, the setup is so pure and clean. It, I couldn't have asked for better a year ago. I couldn't have asked for better, guys. And gal, or gals, maybe a couple gals, not a lot. The metrics tell me there's like 3% of you are women, so it's not a lot. But this is great. Please uh, think about this. Do your own research. Talk to a financial advisor. They're probably on the train now. <laughs> and I just want you all to benefit from this in the future, if you can, and if you've come to the same conclusions I do. And that's why I put this out here. This is why I do what I do. If you could, like, subscribe, ring the bell. And if you want to join too, it's like $3 a month for the starter pack. That helps support my work. I want to get out to as many people as possible. So if you could share content too, even if you don't pay to subscribe. The only real benefits right now to subscriptions, I'm trying to add some more stuff too. But the only real benefits are if you pay at least $3 a month, you can in chat on the live um, sessions that I do ask questions, have me pull up, you know, charts and I can give my take and input, that kind of stuff. You can get dialogue because just like on X, I've made it to where it's like members only. On X, it's verified only, but I just want to get rid of the clutter. I want to get rid of the spam. I want to get rid of the haters. I don't want to have to fight with people in chat. I'm trying to get a message out there that I believe is positive and can benefit people. And I want a community that works together to find opportunities and dissect them and figure out if they're good or bad and come to conclusions together. And our opinions might differ, but I want it to be a respectful community where people are there to serve each other, including myself, right? I'm retired. I'm doing this for fun. I'm doing this so that I can benefit other people because I found that in retirement, you can really get bored and feel alone because other people are doing stuff. And if you're not doing stuff, that fulfills you, you won't feel very good about yourself, at least my personal experience, right? So this is my way of feeling good about myself. When I look at YouTube comments or X comments and people tell me they're making money, I can't guarantee that. People can lose money too. If you don't understand, if you don't, all kinds of things can happen, man. But I try, I try to provide value. That's what I'm here for. And I'm going to keep doing that and I'm going to try and get better at it. And that's a promise I can make, that I will try really hard. And uh, anyway, that's my this is my rant for the weekend. This is an even longer one. Broke that 30-minute mark. But I love you guys, and I thank you for everything. And uh, let's grow together and become awesome. See you guys Tuesday.